seconds. The terrible moment. 25 years later, on the eve of the anniversary of John F. Kennedy's assassination, we'll look at the Kennedy legacy, in fact, in legend, and as portrayed in today's media. Good evening. I'm Forrest Sawyer, and this is Nightline. Was Lee Harvey Oswald really out to get John Kennedy, or was John Connolly the target? Tonight, we'll talk with the author of a new book that argues that Governor Connolly was Oswald's intended victim and will be joined by Governor Connolly himself. Change jobs. This is ABC News Nightline. Substituting for Ted Koppel and reporting from Washington, Forrest Sawyer. For those of us who are old enough, this has been a day of remembering, recalling the glamour of the Kennedy presidency and how it felt then. In a few minutes, we will look at the myth of Camelot and the reality of Kennedy's time in office. But first, the assassination itself. Though we may never know what really happened, there are numerous theories, and one of them, featured in this week's Time magazine, has gained new prominence, and it goes like this. Lee Harvey Oswald was not trying to kill Kennedy at all. He was really after Texas Governor John Connolly. Connolly had been Secretary of the Navy when Oswald received a dishonorable discharge from the Marines, and there's evidence that Oswald resented him. Even Oswald's wife, Marina, testified that she thought her husband was trying to kill Connolly. And the man who has resurfaced this theory is James Reston, Jr., author of the forthcoming book, The Great Expectations of John Connolly. He joins us tonight in our Washington studio. And Governor Connolly is also with us from our affiliate KTRK in Houston. Mr. Reston, there really is no new evidence here. In fact, there's nothing that the Warren Commission itself did not see. Why are you so convinced that Oswald was after Mr. Connolly? Well, when you say there's no new evidence, we have 25 volumes of the Warren Commission report, and that is, was compressed into one volume, uh, which everybody pays attention to now. So, indeed, much and indeed most of the argument that I'm making in Time, Time magazine comes from the Warren documents themselves. But I think the basic premise was wrong uh, uh, of the country and, in effect, of the Warren Commission. And that was that for so heinous a crime, so colossal a crime as this, there had to be a colossal motive behind it. And in making this biography of, of John Connolly, I had to look into to this event, which really describes his heroic aspect, John Connolly's heroic aspect, to the uh, country at, at large. His heroicism comes to most Americans for having survived this awful event. And so it was natural, I think, that I would want to look into uh, the motive of, of the intended killer. Here. I understand you want to look into the motive of it. I'm, I'm asking why you were so convinced that this theory is the right one. Well, you know, I think when you're talking about a really uh, an undistinguished human being, as Lee Harvey Oswald was, uh, he really was one of the wretched of the earth. It uh, does not make sense to posit upon him, as did the Warren Commission, these grandiose motivations of um, his affection for Russia or for Cuba or, or the like. This is a man who had a ninth grade education. And he was buffeted about all his life in Russia as well as in, in this country. What makes sense of uh, uh, turning such a character as this into a murderer is not grand abstract intellectual theories of, of ideology, but a human direct grudge. And it is the grudge uh, that he held for those who, who changed uh, his discharge from honorable to dishonorable. But look, there I are an awful lot of, of, of arguments that are against it. For instance, he could have gotten a better shot if he had fired at Connolly earlier. He was blocked when he fired at Connolly at that location. Furthermore, if he wanted to shoot Governor Connolly, he certainly could have done it when the president wasn't there and he didn't have all that security around him. Well, no, nobody can really sort out what went through that man's mind in the seconds and whether he would have been better, better served to shoot when he was coming down Houston Street as to when, when the motorcade was going down Elm Street. The point is psychologists talk about something called a motor program, where when somebody sets out to do a terrible thing and an irrational thing, they do not make these fine judgments about this 
this uh, body and that head and this millimeter and where I should start from. The real, uh, the critical moment here is not the motorcade coming around that corner, but two days beforehand when he decides that uh, he wants to do this awful thing. Governor Connolly, how about it? Do you think you might have been the target? Well, <clears throat> no one knows what was in the mind of Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, I would say there are two, two things that would mitigate against it, certainly. Uh, first, uh, Oswald uh, certainly had no way of being sure that I was even going to be in the car with President Kennedy. Uh, that's number one. Uh, secondly, if he'd really wanted to kill me, he could have done it a uh, hundred times in a hundred different places all over Texas. I was speaking all over the state at the time, uh, basically unprotected. Uh, it could have been done in a much, much easier fashion and probably in a way that uh, he would never have been apprehended. Uh, so I, I think all the logic uh, uh, would dictate otherwise. Uh, in any event, I think uh, uh, if I was a target, uh, I was probably a secondary target. Uh, the man fired three shots. He hit three times. He hit President Kennedy twice and me once. So uh, I have to assume that, uh, that at the worst or the best, uh, however you view it, uh, he hit precisely the individuals he was shooting at. Well, you say three times. The Warren Commission actually said there were two bullets. You have said in the past you thought there were three bullets. Do you think there might have been somebody else there shooting as you No, no there, was, no, no, there were three shots, and uh, I think uh, everyone who knows anything about it recognizes that there were three shots. Uh, and the Warren Commission got confused in their, uh, in their resolution, I think, because they only found two bullets, but uh, there were three shots fired. There's no question about that. And... Uh, the president got hit by the first one, I got hit by the second, and he got hit by the third. Uh, now, Mr. Reston talks about the, the motive, uh, his hatred of me, uh, Oswald's hatred of me, yet he fired at General Walker, according to uh, Mr. Reston in his uh, book, uh, a short time before that, and apparently had no such hatred of him. So uh, uh, I don't know by what <clears throat> logic you can assume that I was his primary target. Mr. Reston, we only have a very few seconds left. Is it fair to say that we almost certainly will never know for sure about what his motives were and what really happened there? Well, I think that that's probably true, but, but uh, to believe that Lee Harvey Oswald was after John Kennedy, you have to believe that he was a grand thinker and that he could, he could uh, become a murderer on the basis of abstract intellectual ideology. And a ninth grade semi-literate man, such as Lee Harvey Oswald was, is not motivated and turned into a killer by Marxist ideology. One does not become a killer because one is simply a Marxist or have affection for Cuba. There has to be something immediate that affects a, a man's life like this. James and when West. he came back from Russia uh, and tried to get a job one place and another and another, it was this military discharge, most of all, that blocked him from a proper employment. James so, Reston, Jr. Mars. is the author of uh, The Great Expectations of John Connolly. Thank you for joining us, sir. And Governor Connolly, if I may, I would like to ask you to stay with us so that we could talk about your recollections of that day and talk about President Kennedy. All right. But first, when we come back, we are going to remember Kennedy. Nightline's Judd Rose looks at the making of an American legend. This is ABC News Nightline, brought to you by Ford. 25 years ago seemed to change everything for us. America has come to measure itself from that day forward. But how much of what we remember about President Kennedy is real, and how much is legend? Here's Nightline correspondent Judd Rose with a look at our fallen president and the dreams we've wrapped around him. I just almost still feel the, the cheers at this moment of people uh, waving and greeting this president of the United States to Dallas. And in the next block, uh, his life. So the ended. first shot was fired as soon as they rounded the corner and it missed. The second shot was fired right about here, and that's the single I bullet theory. I believe more before. now than I did 25 years ago that that was a conspiracy of some kind. Oh, definitely. And 25 years them. ago, we believed anything they told us, but today. One man acting alone did not. They went down the street and see where this car's going? Back there, somewhere in the middle of the streets where they shot the president. For the children, he's only a lesson in a history book. They're too young to remember. The rest of us can't forget. History stood still for three days. This is where it all happened. And it's just a real awesome feeling. 
So every day of the year, they come here to Dealey Plaza in Dallas. They take their pictures and stroll on a grassy knoll. They retrace the route, stare at the old book depository building, and count up six floors to point out the window where the shots were fired. It just seems to me like you can just kind of feel the shots or hear the shots, even though it happened so many years ago. If you come here, somehow the physical reality of this place makes the impossible seem more possible. But if you don't come to Dealey Plaza this year, well, then the assassination is very much as it was 25 years ago. Reality framed by a television set. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died. This CBS special, a riveting look back at the TV coverage of the assassination, is just one of a deluge of programs timed to coincide with the anniversary. Some are studious, like this PBS special using 1988 technology to re-examine the murder. Some are valentines to Camelot, like this on the Disney Channel. Elegance, youth, warmth emanated from the decorous presidential mansion. But it's not all tributes. This month being a crucial TV ratings period, JFK is also a convenient target for tabloid TV. Well, let me tell you something, pal. John F. Kennedy may have screwed his share, but he didn't screw the American public like some presidents did. She was the sex goddess of the movies. He was the president of the United States. Details of their affair, some of them secret for a quarter of a century, are told for the first time now. Lee Harvey Oswald never had his day in court, until now. The saddest, sickest part of the Kennedy extravaganza is that the Kennedy name becomes fodder for Geraldo Rivera's mill. So what's new? Tabloid TV, after all, is based on the tabloid press, and the Kennedys have long been their favorite fodder. It's a long way from this to this. The Kennedys are just another commodity to use to sell things, whether it's tabloids, magazine covers, TV shows, miniseries, you can use them. Who could resist? Young, beautiful, and dynamic, a poor immigrant family rising to wealth and power amid public triumphs and personal tragedies. If the Kennedys hadn't existed, Hollywood would have invented them. But they did, so Hollywood reinvented them. You won't fail. Kennedys don't fail. Oh, yeah. You'd be the best first lady ever. We cannot and we will not accept Soviet missiles in Cuba. Since 1963, there have been almost as many Kennedy movies as there are Kennedys. The Cuban Missile Crisis, Young Joe's wartime death, Jackie's marriage to Onassis, and of course, that day in Dallas, all reduced to a soap opera. It's important I look all right in Dallas. Why do I have to be blown around in a motorcade first? No bubble. Oh, I don't think it's trivializing them, and I don't think it hurts them any. And I mean, they by now, they've had so much, they can surely rise above it and ignore it. But it's hard to ignore the sort of stories that have surfaced in the past decade. Stories of Kennedy, the insatiable womanizer. Reports of his involvement with Marilyn Monroe and with the mistress of a mafia boss. We're not just talking about somebody being unfaithful to their wife here. We're talking about how it affects their... Uh, as to what he did, as to what effect it had, as to his relationship with uh, Hoover. Uh, since I was there and the critics were not, and I saw none of that, I think it's bullshit. A little later, we are going to look at how history has judged the Kennedy presidency. But first, when we return, we will ask Governor Connolly how he remembers the era. It's a radio. His testimony helped send over a hundred to death row. Should expert witnesses help decide who gets the death penalty? 2020, Friday. The cops in a real world of challenge, fear, and frustration. David Hartman's special reports this week on Good Morning America. With us again now, former Texas governor, John Connolly. Governor Connolly, for 25 years now, every November 22nd, you have had to think about what happened there in Dealey Plaza. You have had to relive those moments. Tonight, as you look back on them, do those events seem far away, or are they still very real and very fresh? Well, both. They, they seem like they happened eons ago, and yet the memory is so vivid that uh, they could have happened yesterday. What is the thing that seems to come up in your mind the most? Well, I think uh, looking at uh, the coverage today, uh, uh, I think uh, we're, we're seeing uh, the myths of the Kennedys, uh, and I don't think uh, the time has come when history will really look at uh, 
the Kennedy administration with a realistic eye. And, and how could we? When you see a beautiful little girl uh, kneeling uh, with her hand on her, her father's coffin, and when you see a, a, a handsome little boy uh, standing with a military salute uh, by his slain father, uh, how can you feel anything but the utmost sympathy? And uh, it's, it's a scene of pathos, of, uh, of remorse, of, uh, of tragedy. And, uh, the, and that's the way we now view uh, President Kennedy. Admirers of President Kennedy say that when they talk of his greatness and when they talk of what we missed with this tragedy, it is really the potential of the man which they missed the most. He could have grown into a tremendously powerful president. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think he, he might well have. He didn't. He didn't have an opportunity to, to do so. Uh, he was actually in Texas, as you know, uh, trying to uh, ensure his political fortunes uh, for 1964. Uh, he was going to have a tough race, according to his own views, and uh, he was trying to do something about it early on in 1963. But he had the potential, I think. He had the, he had the, uh, the, the, the charisma, he had the charm, he was surrounded by very capable people, uh, he was a superb orator. Uh, he might well have developed into an outstanding uh, leader, not only for the nation, but for the free world. Just a very few seconds, about 15 seconds, his greatest strength and his greatest weakness in your estimation. Well, I, I think his greatest strength was uh, the, the confidence that he generated in people. Uh, his, his greatest weakness probably uh, was that uh, he'd not come into the office as well prepared as he might have been, because up until that time, uh, he didn't seriously take his job uh, uh, in the Senate or in the House. Texas Governor John Connolly, thank you very much for joining us tonight, sir. When we come back, we'll see what history has to say. Nightline correspondent Judd Rose looks at what John Kennedy really did accomplish during his brief thousand days in the White House. Introducing a sedan with the heart of a lion, the all-new Toyota. Not long after Kennedy died, just a thousand days in office when it seemed there was no job too big for America. But 25 years later, not everyone is wearing rose-colored glasses. How does history judge the Kennedy presidency? We asked Nightline correspondent Judd Rose to find out. I knew Jack Kennedy. Jack Kennedy was a friend of mine. Senator, you're no Jack Kennedy. Then again, who is? For smarts and style and inspiration, John Kennedy is the standard by which we judge our leaders. Those who tried to wrap themselves in the mystique have been found wanting. John Kennedy still looms so large in our lives that just this month, a poll showed that most Americans, even now, consider him our greatest president. Still, the passage of 25 years has inevitably given rise to a more dry-eyed look at the differences between the man and the myth. The revisionist view of Camelot is that Jack Kennedy was no Jack Kennedy. He spoke in language that was very tough. That you know, we, we shall pay any price bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. Yet he wouldn't provide air cover uh, for these exiles who, who were trying to overthrow Fidel Castro, who had established his communist base in Cuba. Um, he did not have the guts, as it were, that, that, you know, that the rhetoric uh, proclaimed. That's the heart of the revisionist view, that the rhetoric didn't match the record. That the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans. Kennedy is remembered as the very symbol of that new generation, but the revisionists say he merely coincided with that era of change. There's a wonderful phrase from Emerson, events are in the saddle and ride mankind and that's what happened with john kennedy events were in the saddle and he was hitching on i mean he didn't set those things he didn't even want to be a part of the civil rights thing it was exceeding him he had to catch up with martin luther king's parade even his admirers admit kennedy came late to civil rights but his time was so brief his record so scant that the rest is an intriguing series of what ifs on civil rights cuba the arms race Vietnam. He would not have pulled from Vietnam. He, he didn't have the political courage to do it if he, if he even intended to, but there's no evidence whatsoever that he intended to. This is a country in which uh, uh, small critics always uh, bark at great men, and John F. Kennedy was a great man. All 
all this will not be finished in the first 100 days, nor will it be finished in the first 1,000 days, nor in the life of this administration, nor even perhaps in our lifetime on this planet. But let us begin. I would hope that those who can remember Kennedy, the president, and those who can read about him if they cannot uh, remember, would stop and realize that uh, that was a special era under a special leader. Today, we did remember him at the place where he's buried and at the place where he died. Remember what I told you about what he said in his inauguration speech? Yeah. What did he say? He said, um, do not, do not um, ask what your country can do for you. Ask what, what you can do for your country. That's right. 25 years later, we teach our children about a man who has merged so utterly with his myth, it's hard to tell the difference. But there is one. He was not as good as his apologists would have him. There was no Camelot. But he had charm and style, and that was nice. And he was our first television president. He was well-read. He had a sense of contemporary history. So there was a sense, I think, of a president who was good in getting better. 25 years. And that's our report for tonight. I'm Forrest Sawyer in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night. This has been ABC News Nightline. If you wish a printed transcript of this or any Nightline broadcast, please send $3 to 267 Broadway, New York, New York, 10007.